Kutam Miluludi Zwamid. Karar Nam. Welcome once again to the Dimension of Destiny. The beautiful crucible I use to melt genius, absurdity, and Himalayan salt to forge the solid bars of entertainment that you're used to. How was everybody's new year? Well, that bad? Sucks to be you, I guess. Anyway, we're forced once again to search for a new home. It's not all bad. Channel Glazes was beginning to smell. Another thing with a touch of Pong was our old civilization, the Hairy Metal. Funny as the name is, I think we're due an upgrade. So with no further ado, allow me to introduce the dwarves of the Icy Work. The only funniness here is the fact that they're nestled in the Scaly Beak Mountains, a self-proclaimed scorching area. I would suggest the name was intentionally subversive, but these are dwarves. Much more likely they named it in beseechment. Looking at the topography, I've decided to keep close to Granite Clobbers, our civilization's seat of power, if you can call it that. Uh, to the south is a haunted shrubland, which could be interesting, but no. Let's look instead to Ruin Breakfast, the major river in this area. At the base of this intersection there's a little kink, and I think it would be a nice place to set ourselves up. No time like the present. A new chapter of Dwarven history begins here, at this place, Hammerlock. Strike the Earth! <gasps> so, yes, here we are with our dwarves milling around aimlessly at the base of the low hills. Now, normally we'd get to introductions, but after talking to Snod, I'm starting to think he's right to say that my attachment to specific individuals is clouding my judgement. I need these little sods to push through their petty discomfort, and it's hard to freeze your heart when you know the squinty one comes from a broken home and just wants to be loved. No, I'm not saying which. Right, so I'd better kick these complete strangers into gear. Get them set up underground and such. Well, it can't hurt to take a look at our new river first, though, right? Cor, look at it. See now, this is where you build a boat. Uh, though, please don't get excited. That isn't what we'll be doing. At least not until I find a way to teach the dwarves what nails are. No. Though the river may play a pivotal role at some point, I have always wanted to play with water power and we're better than here. I even happened to see some hippos previously. Imagine the use I could put a herd of them to. So gosh darned exciting! I've let some time pass and the dwarves have busied themselves with getting a basic fort dug out. You didn't miss much. Not like you haven't seen me do this three times before. Uh, though perhaps I shouldn't be including Slapgland. Uh, regardless, the fort is looking... fine. Uh, the tavern's a hit. They've named it the Sweetness of Rax for very obvious reasons. It houses neither shelving nor confection. Yes. To the tavern's side is a kitchen. Very important. Possibly more important is Irvad, though. Once the fort's only fisher dwarf. Then it became clear the fish weren't biting, so he took to being our full-time cook. He took to it like a duck to water, in fact, which is unsurprising when you consider how clever he is, and oh damn, I'm doing it again. <laughs> the real reason we're checking in right now, though, is that we had notice of some migrants, but they don't appear to have materialised. I had worried they'd entered from the other side of the river, but it seems 
clear. Ah, here they are. What are you all doing? Honestly, if I hadn't manifested them myself, I'd think their creator cut corners on hollow heads. Oh, look, it's Apple! I told Graham about her. She loves Gabbro men for their rockiness, and with Graham being made of rock himself, I thought he'd get a kick out of it. Uh, he said, So she's got eyes, then, and swanned off. Well, if swans weighed half a ton. Damn, I'm doing it again! Time jump! It's been a month. Autumn has given the boot to warm days, and we're welcoming outpost liaison Meng to the fortress. Oh, this is nice, isn't it? Uh, Queen Irvad was fine, but shaking things up never hurt anybody. It would appear that Meng's in good shape, which he'll be glad for as he chases our expedition leader Ral for a day and a half. Oh, there's that strange passage of time again. Ah, it looks like he's caught him. Let's get to business. The world is the same as ever. I suppose some things just never change. <laughs> Literally. And we're requesting clothing and drinks from the mountain home. Saves us worrying about tailoring for a little while, hopefully, and you could never have enough booze with dwarves around. Granite clobbers want fish. Ha! <laughs> Fat chance. And meat. I don't think we'll be able to help. Uh, thank you for your liaising, Meng. May the mountain home know only success. Anu Zishon. As for the merchants, we'll give them some time to finish setting out their wares, and then we'll get down to haggling. I do hope whoever our broker is is up to the task. Because I'm cold and detached, and therefore am uncertain of who they are. And so unsure as to their ability to perform. Oh, it's Minkot, and she's amazing. She's got this little... Oh, you're so bloody weak! Clipboard. Or maybe she doesn't. Here we have something exciting. I spent a little time... Okay, quite a lot of time... Designing the layout for our dwarves' bedrooms. It began with the 16 to the north, of course. But the tileable nature of the design meant that when our population began to exceed that figure, it was simple to add to. Each dwarf gets a frankly decadent six tiles of personal space, a handcrafted bed, coffer and cabinet built of only the finest materials, uh, wood and gypsum respectively, and some smooth, smooth walls and floor. Okay, yes, they're awful little cells, but at least they're arranged in a way that's pleasant to look at. Uh, pleasant for us, that is. The dwarves aren't capable of staring through solid rock, and given there's not a torch nor lamp within the fortress, I'm forced to believe they find their way around through vibrations and beard hairs. Oh, like moles, if moles wore trousers and drank too much. Oh, one more benefit of the layout is that I was able to fit a little temple to no specific deity. The dwarves have named it the Quills of Shearing because the pen is mightier than the woolly jumper and have decorated it with four statues. Two dwarves, a llama, which is at least fitting to the name, and a leech, which I assume speaks more to the carving prowess of the sculptor than anything else. It does the job, and much like the tavern, will remain citizen only for the time being. Ah, oh, we're being graced by the big people. Hello there, man -bird. Fondled? Curled? Why have the humans sent us a 21-year-old novice merchant? Oh, and a glassmaker, because that's relevant. Ah, why do I bother? You know what? I'm not even going to give them the time of day. Catch me trading with a snot-nosed little upstart. I think not. So we got a load of fish and meat from them. It turns out Mamba's not such a bad egg after all. She's taken a gap year to learn about other cultures and figured a merchant would be best for that. Which you have to admit is very clever. 
I asked all about the glass making and she's agreed. It's a massive waste of time and resources, which is why she's only a novice. After the year, she'll go back to Olid Mong to finish her studies in goblin theory, where she'll meet her soulmate, fall madly in love and have three children, join a group of settlers heading for the colourless hills, lose her husband to squiddlepox, remarry the village baker, have two more children, become moderately addicted to quilting and die at the ripe old age of 87 after discovering a previously unknown but completely deadly allergy to pine nuts. <sighs> Are you feeling better now? Yes. Now I would like to show you something the dwarves have been working on, but to do so I first need to show you this. This is a strip mine. With it I discovered absolutely diddly squat. Well, rough colours, but they're everywhere. No, don't mind Melville and Avaz, I sent them down to give you something to watch whilst I whinge. But yes, no mining discoveries on this level. So we delve deeper. Here we found, uh, this time you're watching Erosh, Obok, Abel and Risen digging randomly. Not a one of them lower than a master miner, by the by. Uh, but anyway, yes, notice the distinct lack of squiddly vein mining. No metals on this level either. Petrified wood, which the game was excited to notify me of whilst telling me it's useful for nothing besides annoying elves. I can do that on my own. We delved deeper still. And we were rewarded with Cassiterite. Bloody tin. The world knows we're a fortress of guffy bean-eating planetarians, so it's gifted us with the means to preserve them. It's not all bad, of course. Now we've got some tin, all we need is copper, and we'll be on our way to bronze. Iron's lumpy step sibling. Even better, if we utilise the bismuth we also don't have, we could make bismuth bronze and save some tin. The only bloody metal we've found so far. All of this said to introduce the new endeavour I will be calling... Project, are there any metals in that hill over there? Oh, there aren't. Ah, well, we've started hollowing it out now, so we may as well finish. I'm aware it's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, but yes, would you look at that? With four accomplished miners, it took almost no time at all. And uh, we've begun on the second floor already. Uh, by which I mean we're halfway done. Cool. Goes to show what a little bit of practice can do for you. Uh, you've noticed the matching pillars, I'm sure. I didn't want a mountain collapsing down on our diggers, and this way, when they channel the floor, everything should match up, and we'll eventually be left with a feat of dwarven ingenuity to be proud of. Or at least it'll be somewhere to store stuff. <laughs> Look at this! The bit they've got left looks like a wizard bowling. I don't know what my ex-wife was talking about. I'm so easy to please. And that's going to do it for another episode. Now, I'm sure most of you have seen Snodford's new series. Over 500 views and still climbing on my very first episode. Oh, go suck a penguin's bike crack. <laughs> Bloody beginner's luck. Anyway, yes, I know you all saw it, so I just wanted to stress how this will not mean an end to my own episodes. No, for the foreseeable future we shall, however, be sharing space on crumpet sounds. Uh, you'll get Mr. Bushpig's Just the Tip one week, and then my much more marvellous self the following. Oh, and let it be known, first person to tip him off to the fact that I'm using one of his quantum stockpiles, uh, because it works a charm to keep the place tidy, uh, will meet the bad end of my deific wrath. With all that cleared up, it just leaves me to thank you all for watching, invite you to like, comment and subscribe for more, and bid you a very fond farewell. Anu's a shon. And a very happy new year. Danus is shone. You know.
Despite the aggravation of working for months and having you just swan in to reap the rewards, I am still genuinely proud of what you accomplished. Oh, thank you, Flemothy. That means a lot. That being said, I'm still going to crush you. Bring it on, Crevice. Bring it on.